Good morning, men. Okay, we're doing a remix of the book, The Man in the Mirror, solving the 24 problems men face. When this book first came out, the working title I sent it to the publisher with was The Problems of Men. Uh, they said, I, we think that might be a little negative. <laughs> it never really had occurred to me that it might be negative, but <clears throat> anyway, so we, uh, we're now in, uh, what is it, uh, chapter 16 on uh, pride. We have finished off the sections on solving our identity problems, solving our relationship problems, solving our time problems, solving our money problems, or I guess it was money time. And now we're going to talk about solving our temperament problems dealing with emotions and temperament. And this first one is going to be on pride. Here's what we'll do this morning. We'll have several takes on pride. Then we'll look at God's Word on pride. And then we'll talk a little bit about how to conquer pride and, and work towards more of a, a humble heart. So uh, first, let's do several takes on pride. I want to begin with a quote from... Uh, mere Christianity on this subject. And this is the single best chapter on... Uh, well, actually, the single best chapter, of course, is in The Man in the Mirror, but the second best chapter on pride <laughs> is in Mere Christianity. I say this in the most humble way I can. <laughs> and the single... That was the point of the joke. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> the single best quote on pride, though, does come from C.S. Lewis in his chapter called The Great Sin out of Mere Christianity. So I'm going to read this to you as we start. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else, and of which hardly any people except Christians ever imagine that they themselves are guilty. I have heard people admit that they are bad-tempered, or that they cannot keep their heads about girls or drink, or even that they are cowards. I do not think I have ever heard anyone who, is, who was not a Christian accuse himself of this vice. <clears throat> and at the same time, I have very seldom met anyone who is not a Christian who showed the slightest mercy to it in others. There is no fault which makes a man more unpopular and no fault of which we are more unconscious of in ourselves. And the more we have it ourselves, the more we dislike it in others. The vice I am talking about is pride or self-conceit, and the virtue opposite to it in Christian morals is called humility. Pride. In the dictionary... The kind of pride that we're talking about, which I'm going to call pride, uh, actually I'm going to call it pride type one here, an inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority, whether it's cherished in the mind or displayed in bearing conduct, etc. So in other words, some guys just behave with overweening pride. They just drip pride. You, just, you can just tell they think they're so much better than you and they look so down on you and it's despicable, but just as prideful is to cherish it in your mind. In other words, you put on your game face, you have a lot of social skill, a lot of emotional intelligence. And so you don't want to look that way, but you do look down on other people in your, in your mind. You are that way. And then humility, the two types of humility we'll talk about today too. 
Humility, as you say, as Lewis says, the opposite in Christian virtues from pride is a modest sense of one's importance or rank. I built a building in the Lake Lucian Executive Center called Maitland Colonnades. It's still one of the premier suburban office buildings in town. Everything is granite that you touch. It has two atriums soaring all the way to the top of the three stories. Beautiful building. And there is a parking garage. I think it may have been the first parking garage constructed for a suburban office building in Orlando. As equals the biggest building I've ever built. It's a magnificent structure. So when I finished it, we put in the parking garage near the front, closest to the building, a number of spaces that were designated reserved. And since I built the building, <laughs> I took the closest reserved parking space for myself. But within a few days, I began to have a problem. And that problem was is that I started thinking in my mind, now cherishing in my mind, certainly not you would never be able to tell by looking, but, or maybe you would, and I just didn't know, but, but I, in my mind, I started thinking of myself as better than the other people who had to walk past my car in the afternoon when I was able to stop at this reserved parking place. And you know, I just basically, I had this, started to get this smugness in my heart, this smug feeling of superiority, like I was somehow better than these people because I had this parking place. And this went on and on and on and got worse and worse and worse. And I was trying to work it out I was trying to pray it out, trying to think it out, asking the Holy Spirit to help me. And I couldn't get rid of it, and it kept getting worse. So finally, what I did was, is I gave up my parking place. And I said, what I'm going to do is, I, for, for a little while, I just need to give this parking place up, and I need to go park in the back of the building till I get this sorted out and, and, and you know, a couple weeks, and then... And then I'll come back and, you know, I can take the parking space again. <laughs> so I did that. And now, every day, so I had been thinking that I was superior to people who didn't have these reserved parking places. But now I'm in the back of the building, and every day I'm walking by the people who are in those reserved parking places, none of whom know me, thinking how superior I am to them because I'm so humble that I can go to the back of the building. I said, God, what, what's up? What's up with this? I spent nine months in the back of that parking lot, the back parking garage, trying to sort this out until I kindly, finally was able, by God's grace, to come to grips with this pride. Pride is thinking, you must wish you were me. I'm cool. Envy is different. Envy is thinking, I wish I, were, I was you. So this is, that's not pride. Me thinking that I wish I was you, that's, that's just envy. But pride, you must wish you were me. Humility, on the other hand, it's not thinking about you or me at all. That's the big idea. And so, really, pride comes from thinking horizontally, comparing myself to you. Humility comes from thinking vertically. When we have our eyes focused on God, our eyes are not focused on me and you. And it releases us from the, the, the shackles and the bondage of this. 
And so here's the big idea today. <clears throat> Pride is a sin of comparison in which I compare my strengths to your weaknesses. In other words, when you walk in here <clears throat> and you think to yourself, well, I'm not going to sit at that table because I make more money than those people. They're not as strong in this area as me. Or maybe you're at a parking uh, traffic light and you have a luxury car and the person sitting next to you drives a Honda. Well, you know, it's interesting. Here's another way pride works. <laughs> Hadn't thought about this. Oh, actually, I've thought about it, but I didn't think about it for the talk until just now. But I drive a a vintage Porsche. That's my car. My wife's car is a Honda. And I often drive the Honda. And I'm so proud, I'll be sitting at a traffic light next to somebody in a Lexus who I can look, you know, glances over me with that smug look, thinking they're better than me. And I'm so proud, I'm thinking, well, actually, you don't know it, but I'm really better than you because I have a Porsche. <laughs> <laughs> This is how insidious pride is. This is... <laughs> <clears throat> or it might be your job title or your position in, the, in an organization that leads you because the other person, they're weaker than you. They don't have maybe the... The, maybe they'll never have the same position as you, and you know it. And so you compare your strength, your acumen that allowed you to get this position to their weakness, their inability to get it. Or we do the same thing with, with parenting. We don't, we don't compare ourselves to dads who are doing a better job than us. We pick a guy out and who's not being, whose kids are not maybe turning out the way that ours are turning out. And... We think that we are superior. We have this feeling of superiority instead of understanding that this comes from the grace of God. Or maybe it's marriage. You've got a good marriage. Somebody else that you know is struggling with the marriage. And so you end up comparing the strength of your marriage to the weakness of their marriage. This is the sin of pride. Pride is a sin of comparison in which I compare my strengths to your weaknesses. Okay? Now, it's not just in these kinds of worldly things. It might be in righteousness. You know, the longer you're a Christian, guess what? The more righteous you do become. Actually. I mean, it really does work. But then the tendency is, is to say, well, I'm so strong in righteousness, I'm more righteous th than this person. And the sin of pride begins to creep in. Or even in your generosity. Maybe you tithe. Maybe somebody you don't know doesn't tithe. And there is this ability to be proud about our generosity. Or even fasting, if you will. Or maybe having a private parking space in a parking garage. Now let's look at God's Word on pride. There is a classic text on it. We'll look at that in several others. Luke chapter 18, verse 9. You should be there. If you're not, please go ahead and turn to Luke 18, 9. And if you see somebody around you without a Bible, why don't you just let them kind of look on with you. Uh, what I'd like everybody to do is get their eyes on the text. Just the whole learning theory thing, you know, kind of go with me on this, okay? It's worth it. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. Okay, this is who we've been talking about in getting this thing going here. So, we're talking about somebody who, you know, is a religious person, but was proud.
had been walking with God for a long time and was righteous and confident of that, looked down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you. God, I thank you. God, in humility, I thank you that I'm not like all other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. That's saved. That's the word for salvation. He went home justified. And the Bible tells us, Romans, that... We are justified by faith and not by our works. It's not by our righteousness. It's not by our charity, our generosity, our fasting. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And really, any other approach leads to pride. Now let's take a look at a few other texts. Go ahead and turn to, I guess, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 4. Or, you know, you might might just want to copy the verses down from up here, or you might just want to listen, kind of like whatever you want to do. Galatians 6, start at verse 3. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. Okay, wow. Can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. What's going on here? Well, uh, pride type one, and by the way, I think I miss, uh, I put the wrong numbers on the on the previous slide. Anyway, pride type one is good pride. It's the right kind of pride. It's talking about it right here in this text. He says, then he can take pride in himself. This is, this is the rejoicing that you can do over just simply doing a job well or being complimented for doing something well. Uh, It's not prideful to, to take pleasure in that compliment or pleasure in that good work. Is it a sin, for example, to be proud of your son because he got a hit at the baseball game? No, that's pride, pride type one. Is it, is it proud? Is your son proud if he's proud that he got a hit at the baseball game? No, that's pride type one. That's a righteous kind of pride. Then look at second. Well, let me just let me just read you Second Corinthians chapter five, verse twelve. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. So there you have pride type one, and pride type two. We're giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, to rejoice with us. And then, back in the Luke um, 18 passage, the last verse, whoever humbles himself will be exalted. 
So pride type one is to take pride in yourself, is to take pride in others, is to rejoice in, uh, in yourself, to rejoice in others. It's what, about what's in the heart. It's about humbling yourself before God. Pride type two, though, again, back to our Luke chapter, ninth verse, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else. That's the wrong kind of pride. Or back in this Galatians 6, 4, where you are turned now, without comparing himself to someone else. So pride type 2 is, is this sin of comparison. And then from 2 Corinthians 5, 12, pride type 2 focuses on what is seen rather than what's in the heart. Romans 12, 3, let me read it. Do not think more highly of yourselves than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. So pride type 2, the wrong kind of pride, is thinking more of yourself than you ought. And then, with regard to humility, it's not thinking more highly of yourself than you ought, the opposite of that. And then James 4, 6, God, gives, uh, God opposes the proud, but gives grace uh, to the humble. And that's the right kind of humility. And there's another kind of, of um, humility, too, that uh, would be self-depreciation, self-deprecation, low self-esteem, uh, which would be a, a, obviously a, a form of dysfunction. I, uh, <clears throat> There's a certain restaurant here in Winter Park. I don't want to disparage the restaurant because it's not about the restaurant. It's called Briar Patch. And it's a great place, or I thought it was a great place, to meet people for breakfast. This year, I've been stood up for breakfast four times at the Briar Patch. Now, as it happened, one of the guys I was able to call on the cell phone, and he, he did arrive eventually about 30 minutes late. He was sitting at his computer and forgot. Um, one, one man realized that he had made a mistake in contact. Two of the guys never touched base. I never told them. And as far as I know, well, I don't know anything about it. But I got stood up like four, four times at, at the Briar Patch restaurant. And so uh, I've been having a hard time deciding if that has led to humility type one or humility type two. <laughs> but what this, this sin is so insidious, I want you to see that even being stood up four times for breakfast and, and thinking what a, what, what a long-suffering servant of Jesus Christ I am, how even that can be a temptation to pride. Because what I found was that I was thinking to myself how much humbler I must be than they are because I didn't feel the need to, to follow up and make a big deal about it. How I just, I just grinned and, and have been grinning and bearing it and not making a big deal about it. And, uh, and gosh, I bet they wish they were like me. So my strength, okay, is that I could remember I had a breakfast appointment. Their weakness is that they apparently were unable to remember that they had a breakfast appointment. Pride is a sin of comparison in which I compare something where I have a strong suit to something where you have maybe not so much in order to make myself feel better about myself. All right? And then let's just take a, a look at conquering pride toward a humble heart. There are tells, a few tells. You can probably come up with some more. Remember in Casino Royale, the 007 movie that uh, is it David Craig, 007? He thought he'd discovered a tell 
And they were gambling for, what, $100 million or whatever it was. And so, just as in cards, there are tells in pride. Here are a few. The way you treat the least of these. Waitresses. Do you treat waitresses like you think you're more important than they do? Sometimes just watch in a restaurant the way people treat waitresses. Watch the way that you treat a waitress. Another tell. Um, Are you teachable? Are you coachable? Are you willing to take coaching? Another tell. An unwillingness to admit that you've made a mistake. Now, a great place to apply this, of course, could be with your boss. But even more revealing, because you're more prone to take liberty, would be in a relationship with a woman. Another tell, thinking you have not made a mistake. I mean, one's an unwillingness to make a mistake when you know you've really made it, (laughs) but also (laughs) just thinking you haven't made a mistake in the first place. Another tell, always thinking you're right. Are you always right? I mean, do you have an answer for everything? Final tell, an unwillingness to forgive others or maybe to be forgiven by others. These are all tells, signs of pride. And then let me give you a little example of conquering pride. My first year in business, my, my greatest desire was to get an American Express card. That little green card for somebody just out of college, that represented all the prestige that was necessary for me to feel good about myself. I had a problem. And the problem was is I didn't have enough credit to qualify for the card when I applied. So I I wanted that card so much that I actually asked and got my father-in-law to co-sign the card so that I could... So even though I wasn't qualified to have it on my own, I wanted to make sure that I had that prestige. So uh, I, you know, got got the card. And, um, you know, they put the little member scents on there. I remember one time at a restaurant watching another table of men, and they were comparing the numbers, the member scents dates on their American Express cards to see which of them had more prestige than the other ones. And then they uh, came out with the the platinum card. Even more prestige than the green card, you could now get the platinum card. And by the way, now they've even come out with another card. It's the black card, the the centurion card. And it actually, it's a $5,000 initiation fee to get it. It's $2,500 a year to keep it. to to buy it, and $250,000 a year in expenses in order to be able to keep it. That's the black card. Well, I'm glad they didn't have that back (laughs) back then. (laughs) That's a lot of prestige, but boy, that's a lot lot to get it, too. So this is my platinum card. Now, this card at the time cost seven times as much as the green card. And in order to qualify to even earn the card, be able to get the card, you had to have spent $10,000 on your American Express card within the previous 12 months. Well, I learned about this card many months before it actually came out. (laughs) I was a long way from $10,000, trust me. But I began, I I wanted this prestige so bad that I began charging everything on my American Express card. Airline tickets, hotels, restaurants, luggage, anything I could buy. And all my business travel, 
so that I could get up to $10,000 of expenses so that I could pay seven times as much to get this card so that I could have this, which of course is exactly what the American Express Company wanted me to do, right? And so I got my card and I got my prestige. The only problem was is that I wanted this card for the wrong motive so that I could feel more important than other people. I had allowed myself to be pressed in to the mold of the world. So I uh, gave up my card. I actually saved this. I had to tape it together this morning because I cut the card, you know, in two and decided to keep it as a little souvenir of my own pride. And I turned in the platinum card, got back my green American Express card, you know, better to have a little prestige than none at all. <laughs> the big idea today, pride is a sin of comparison in which I compare my strengths to your weaknesses. Why? So that I can feel more important than you, so that I can feel superior. And you have something you can leave with this morning that is a very powerful metaphor. And that is the Pharisee and the tax collector. And you will have to figure out, you can't do this once for all, but, but you do, as a man, you have to figure out how to conquer the Pharisee in you. You have to figure out how on a daily basis to be a tax collector. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am a proud man. I am a proud man. I have a lot of pride. Um, every man in here is the same way. Um, it has many good sides, but the dark side we must manage. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Would you say that with me? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your teachings on pride in your word. Thank you for this metaphor of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I pray that we would each be able to, to keep that somewhere uh, within reach. And Lord, that we would understand that it's not just our worldly accomplishments about which we can become proud, but even our righteousness and our good deeds can be uh, temptations to pride. Even our humilities can be temptations to pride. Father, I pray that you would guide each of us in the way you would have us go and deliver us from our pride by your Holy Spirit and for your glory. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.